Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. This week we're talking about some really cool research being done by NASA with balloons. Today we're talking with Andrew Hamilton. He's the acting chief of NASA's uh, balloon program office. So, Andrew, I, I guess, you know, everyone thinks of NASA. They're thinking of launching rockets up into space and satellites and stuff like that. Why would you use balloons to do research? That is a, a great question. You know, the, the rockets are all very exciting and they do great work in, in the rocket world. But the balloons for what we fly and where we fly, uh, we give the science community access to the near space environment for extended periods of time. So hours, days or weeks or even months, depending on where we're launching and what we're launching, which is very valuable to the science community because it gives that, that long, a long time to uh, gather a lot of data, a lot of information, which they may not be able to do in some other platforms like um, rockets or airplanes. What kind of observations or research are you, you doing with these balloons? Oh, you name it. Uh, we we uh, satisfy uh, a lot of the science community in heliophysics, astrophysics, earth science, you, you name it. And so we have folks who are looking at the sun, they're looking at the universe, they're looking at stars, you name it, uh, we can help them out. With a balloon, is it where you can reuse that equipment over again? You bet. That's one of the, the cool features about what we do. Uh, and we and we do um, foot stomp that one is we can get your stuff back. Uh, and it's it's very valuable to these guys. I mean, they, they put a lot of time and effort into these instruments, these payloads. And when we launch it and fly it for them, and if we, if we land on land, we'll go out there, we'll pick it up and hand it back to them. They can refurbish it, put it back together and fly again. And we have several customers that we fly routinely uh, just for that very purpose, just so they can keep, keep on with the mission and gather more and more data. Y'all have uh, two different types of balloons that you use. Uh, tell me the difference between the zero pressure balloons and the super pressure balloons that you have. So a zero pressure balloon, that's, that's our, our, our workhorse of, of balloons. We have several sizes of them. But the reason it's called zero pressure is it, it's because it's vented to the atmosphere so that there's zero pressure across the film. So we'll fill it up with helium, uh, enough helium on the ground. It goes, gets up to the atmosphere, into the stratosphere, expands to its full size. And, and if it starts to get too far up, then the excess helium will just vent out. So that it, it maintains a constant volume. Um, and that's good for relatively short periods of flight because, you know, as you lose helium, that, you know, you lose your ability to maintain altitude over a long, long period. Now the super pressure balloon is that's our long duration platform, and because it's a closed volume, we fill it up and we seal it up on the ground. It gets to altitude, and it's uh, it's allowed to stay there at a very narrow range of altitudes for a very long period of time. And our, our the balloon we're working on right now, we're trying to qualify it to last a hundred days, uh, and we're we're doing really really well with that. Uh, our last flight out of New Zealand, we got almost 40 days worth of flight, and we got two more flights coming up in New Zealand next year to continue the qualification process. And the, the difference with that one is because it's so long, long duration, uh, it, it gets an incredible amount of science, very valuable to the, the scientific community just for the fact that it can go out for weeks and months worth of data, which you can't get anywhere else except for actually putting it on a satellite. And, you know, balloons are a much cheaper option than putting it on a satellite. How high up in the atmosphere are these balloons going? So they go up in a stratosphere. So for us, our typical range of altitudes are between 110 and 160,000 feet. And that, that depends on the weight, of the weight of the payload, the size of the balloon, and, and a few other factors. But in that range, it's 110 to 160,000 feet. So these balloons start out decent size. How, how much do they grow as they go up higher into the atmosphere? A lot. So it's, uh, it, you know, if you ever got to watch a video of, of how we do the launch process, you know, we fill a very tiny portion of the balloon and it may be 10% or so of the balloon because as it ex ascends into the atmosphere and gets lower pressure atmosphere, the helium gas inside will expand to its full volume. So our, a lot of workhorse balloon is a 39 million cubic foot balloon. That's a zero pressure balloon. And 
that balloon when fully inflated is about 450 feet across, so it's massive. How long does it take a balloon to get from the ground up to the, the level that it levels off up that 100 plus thousand feet up? It depends, uh, anywhere from two and a half to three hours, depends. Uh, for our, our, our 160,000, our balloon that goes 160,000 feet, that one can take anywhere from four to eight hours because, well, it's, it's way up there, but generally in two and a half, three hours is what we advertise. All right, so you get this big balloon up there in the sky. How do you get the payload back down to the ground? Ah, great question, because like we talked about earlier, we, we want to get it back, right? So the balloon, uh, the payload hangs beneath the balloon on a, on a parachute that's, that's free, free hanging. And so at the end of the mission, when everybody's happy and we found a, a safe spot to bring it down, uh, we send a terminate command and that terminate command will cut away the payload so that it falls to the ground underneath a parachute and it'll float down and, and land. And then the balloon comes down separately in a big ball of plastic. And so that's how we bring both those pieces back to the ground and we go find them, pick them up and bring them home. So you are in the middle, like you said, of, of a project out at Fort Sumner, New Mexico. Uh, what, what kind of uh, research are y'all doing with these uh, payloads that are going up right now? Uh, well, again, we're, we're hitting the gamut. So, uh, we, you know, we've had a couple of uh, student flights because uh, that's one of the things that we, we really cater to in addition to the, the, the science community is we're a developmental platform for students. And uh, that's high school, high school, college, and graduate students. So we've done a couple of those. Uh, we've done some astrophysics. We've done some heliophysics work. So is there a reason that you use New Mexico as the launch place for that? There is. So as you can imagine, uh, as we described earlier, the balloon is just this massive piece of plastic. And on the ground, the whole flight train end to end is about 900 feet. So that's a lot of plastic so that when we, we fill it up and then release it up in the atmosphere, you need to have some very uh, low wind conditions. So, you know, we like to have uh, very low wind conditions both at the surface and all, all the way up to the top of the balloon. And Fort Sumner, where we're at right now, gives us that opportunity. It has a very known, predictable weather pattern this time of year that we take advantage of where we have these very low wind conditions, very stable atmosphere that we can uh, bring the balloon up and then let it go and let it fly away. And we, we actually have multiple launch sites around the world, but Fort Sumner is our, our one we do the most, most flights from. So for these shorter term uh, balloon flights that you're doing, like you're doing at Fort Sumner, how far down the line do they travel before y'all end up bringing down the payload? Depends on the winds. Um, once we get up into the stratosphere, we, our meteorologists are really good about predicting where it's going to go. The, the payloads, the missions can go either several hundred miles or just a few miles, depending on what the stratospheric winds are doing. You know, you were talking about the, the student payloads. How cool is that on y'all's end to know that you're helping kind of developing the next wave of uh, science and space uh, learning with these student payloads? That's, it's super cool. And it, it's, it's really neat to get these young people in here and they're really excited about uh, what, what they're doing. And it's real hands-on work, you know, where they can, they can, they build a thing and they bring it to us and we integrate it onto a, a gondola form and we fly it. And, and it's very satisfying both uh, for them, obviously, and for us to see that we're, we're helping bring that, that next generation of scientists and engineers and get them ready for, for the next adventure. So the balloon program's been around for a while and you've been part of NASA for a while. What changes have you seen? Well, I tell you, there's been a lot of changes and it's, you know, it's a bit of an oxymoron when you, you think of a balloon with such a simple technology, you know, just fill it up and fly it. But we do some very advanced stuff as far as uh, how we are tracking the balloon, how, how we do our telemetry, how we do our commanding. So there's a lot of engineering and science that goes into it uh, to just, or, launch and operate the balloon and then of course track it, follow it, talk to it and then make sure that the science instrument is doing what it needs to do and has all the, has all the resources it needs. So it's definitely uh, advanced over the years, over the decades actually, as we've gotten better and better uh, technology and resources. Well, Andrew, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. It was something that I didn't really know a lot about with NASA and uh, kind of looking into it, found out how cool of a project it is, but I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. You bet, happy to help.